I mean, most of them that I can recall had some human factor uh, in, involved in it. Um, you know, the, the, the gentleman from Dow, uh, I mean, I, I do, do appreciate what Dow does, and, I, and I, I'm learning about procedural automation, and um, I, I appreciate greatly what they do, as opposed to what, you know, what we do on a startup is, is more or less, um, because, I mean, they talk about hands-off, and we're all hands-on. We, we are, okay, you're going to start up. Uh, there comes a the part, you hit the startup button, we give operator the full control over everything, um, and then we take away some of his protection because there's interlocks that just can't happen until you get, and we put timers on them, and when the flow gets to here, we enable them. But invariably, and, and you know, I'm not, I want to think we've had like all these major incidents, but I'm saying in 33 years, there's been a couple. And, uh, and I think, you know, there, it, it's, uh, but they've been human errors. Um, things that uh, should have happened that didn't happen. Um, uh, when, when we shut down, there's some, some, some and, and we've automated them since, but there used to be some sweeps we had to do and, and they didn't get done type of thing. Um, where um, I, I just see, uh, you know, the batch, the batch mentality, the continuous process is which, which is going on when you shut down and start up being just a big boon. Now, whether that's integrated with the safety system, there's probably maybe no way, but to me it's a layer of protection uh, way beyond what we do today. I hope that answers your question. Just to interject, there is a session on procedural automation. I'm uh, going to it. <laughs> at 4 o'clock in time 5, so. Yeah. Any other comments? There was another question out here. Please. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Andy Withers from Rotor Controls. Uh, we manufacture valve actuators both for safety systems and non-safety systems. Um, what I'm quite interested in is whilst I think you're very key, uh, keen on separating the safety systems from the, the, the non-safety control systems, what about the diagnostic systems? So the things that are actually making sure that that safety system is going to work when it's called upon, um, are those ones where you would be willing to integrate so you can get additional information or are they completely separate channels? Uh, and what kind of systems, bus systems or otherwise, would you use? Are they also needing to be certified to the same level of uh, security or safety through diagnostics as they are for the actual safety shutdown signals themselves? Question. Yeah, I can. Yeah. I can. Uh, no, it has to be separate. I mean, the the a SIF, which is a safety instrumented function that is tied to your safety instrumented system. So you've got a logic solver. I mean, I mean, you know how that block diagram looks like, right? Mm -hmm. um, that has to be independently function tested, um, depending on the on the diagnostic coverage you need. To, to meet the SIL level for that SIF. Um, to integrate that and, and have the BPCS provide the simulation, is that what you're asking? Like, like can I, are you saying you want the BPCS to provide the, the, um, the simulation from the sensor? into the logic solver or? No, this is really the, the feedback data that you might get. So in our, in our case, our products are able to actually um, measure the torque profile of a valve. Okay. So there's, there's quite a lot more data available that could <clears throat> be being used to, to test the system and check it is going to function, it's going to be safe. Okay, but so this is you... quite complicated data that may need greater analysis. It may potentially mean you can be safer because you can use that data to predict what's going to happen ahead of time, but it's not simple on-off, failure, not failure. Um, the, the data that, that we get back from your smart uh, positioner or your smart actuator is valuable. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, does it take the place of a, a, a full function test? No. Uh, does it take the place of a partial function test? No. Um, you know, you, you've got to look at it uh, analogous to, to a light bulb. If you turn the light switch on the day you install a light bulb, and you turn the switch on and the light comes on, if you leave it on, then it'll probably meet its 
three or 4,000 hours of, of, of life. But if you turn it on and off every day, every time you turn it off and turn it back on again, it can fail. So we, we need to ensure that whenever, when, when we call for diagnostic testing or a full function test on a SIF at a particular time based on the safety requirement specification, and, and this is kind of hard line, but it must be done. And, and if you don't do it when you say you're going to do it and you allow the time to slide, there should actually be a negative timer. Because as that time becomes more and more, you actually lose the sill rating of that SIF. And the longer it goes, you can reach a point where that SIF is no longer a SIF. It, 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 it's, it's actually useless because you don't know what it's going to do. And that's the danger in a safety system is not knowing what it's going to do. So just in, uh, just in terms of the data itself then, in between the time when you're doing that, that full functional test, how would you interconnect your safety devices to get the additional diagnostics which may not directly account in your calculations but clearly are useful? Th those diagnostic signals would, would come into a maintenance department, uh, typically on a, uh, on a maintenance LAN, and, and they would continually look at that data and make decisions on whether or not they're going to do a function test maybe prematurely on that SIF. Uh, if it's a process control loop, uh, then you would make decisions on whether, you know, I'm getting a little stick in the air, <laughs> a little drag on that valve, sorry, old term talk. Uh, a little drag on that valve stem, so I got I to gotta look at that valve. That, that's what we use that information for. I mean, I'll say this, one of the, uh, uh, at a user's group one time, to me one of the most interesting things I saw was someone that was using uh, smart positioners uh, on their safety systems, they went to all analog, and uh, they did partial stroke testing, I can't remember the frequency, I want to say maybe it was once a week, and they, uh, by using the analog and by using the valve signature, uh, were you know be able to tell what valves they might need to be working on, uh, or you know might even have to come down because uh, you know it it uh, you know wasn't coming off the seat fast enough. So, so I, I mean I, I I know I guess that's what you're talking about, and I can see you. And actually, I want to believe they took they took greater credit for their their partial uh, because they actually had the data to, to back it up when they did their, their calculations. So I see value there. We don't do, we're, we're kind of, um, I'm the process control guy, so you know, that's really an engineering maintenance function, and I don't get involved in that. We, we, we don't do partial stroke testing, but, but I, can, I will say this, I see great value in what you're talking about. Comments, Mike? I'm, the only other thing I'd add is, you know, it, there is a value to bringing that, uh, especially if they're heart devices, bringing that heart diagnostic information up into an asset management system. I think that's what Dan was talking about as well. <laughs> and then using that for uh, some other analyses and, and predictive maintenance, you know, even on uh, instrumentation that's used in SIFs. So, you know, an observation I would make here is that, you know, you're going to be using a common set of technologies for things like device management and d d uh, parameterization and that kind of thing with a, the with a BPCS kind of regardless because that's, that's pretty much how the world works, right? So in, in the long run, at some level there are going to be some common technologies just, just for those kind of functions that are germane to both, even though the systems have entirely different functions from their it's a separate LAN and it's a separate Un server. Understand. And you're not taking credit for it. And you're, and and you're not taking credit for it. Okay. So if we are claiming that the uh, diagnostic data and separate uh, LAN, separate server, again, that if it's simple, it doesn't mean they actually, we may have to put that data via some kind of MCI splitter or something from the transmitter on the wall. So we are going to take off that part there. Other questions from the floor? There's one here, please. I have a small comment. 
basically, if we look at the LOPA, layer of protection analysis, by definition, DCS and ESD system needs to be separate. So they are independent IPLs. These are the basic IPLs, so they are independent protection layers. So now looking at the topic like integrated control and safety systems, there are some functions like uh, one gentleman told that two, sh uh, two captains on one ship cannot run the ship well. So definitely there is an integration requirement between DCS and the ESD system. So what are those integrations requirements? Like if you want to start a pump, then start command going from the DCS to the PLC, but PLC requires or the ESD system requires that pump to trip, then that integration is required. There are lot of value added information from the ESD systems which can be brought into the DCS for the operator because we want a single window system. So that's why integration is required. Second, one question on common, uh, can we share the DCS and BPCS instrument as per the IEC 61508 or 61511, it do not allow the sharing of BPCS or DCS. I agree with that. But what we can look at is what is our safety requirement for that safe function. If we are meeting the safety requirement of that function, uh, of that function by the process control looking at the PHA or the risk analysis, then sharing of BPCS or control can be possible. Am I, am I clear in my views? Uh, this is what uh, we have learned and this is what we are practicing. So whenever we are doing LOPA, we look at the safety target factor. If I am meeting the safety target factor by design, looking at the BPCS control, looking at the operator response, looking at the, the plant design and the ESD system sys credit, then I can allow the sharing of BPCS with ESD. Okay, That's you, my comment. Well, well, comment, could you just identify yourself, sorry, just so people know yeah, where you're sorry. practicing. I am Ajay, a senior process automation engineer working with Equate Petrochemical Company in Kuwait. Okay, thank you. And we are a Dow, venture com uh, Dow joint venture company. Any, any comments? Yeah. Go, go ahead, Dan. You're right and you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said earlier, it all has to make sense for your company. Um, Dow Chemical, yes, they're putting their SIS certified, SIL certified controllers in the same cabinet as their process control co uh, uh, controllers, but it's not on the same backbone, is it? They, they're, you can't, they're not talking to each other. Um, that's just my statement. They are. Same control network, then they're violating IEC 61511. Uh, but they do it because they want to do it. it. Can you hold on for a second? It's, you're inaudible up here. Just, just wait till the microphone gets back here. <clears throat> Please. So, so they're using the same control network. So both controllers, the high integrity controllers and the BPCS controllers, communicate over the same. Uh, control network. The I.O. is separate, eh? so if you think about the I.O. coming into the Marshall Cabinet, we'll use different uh, routing, uh, module bus, uh, going to the high integrity controllers. So then, actually, what, what you've ended up with is you're, you've got common mode uh, or common cause between your logic solvers. Not a good idea. But yeah. that, that's what you want to do, and, and, and that's just my opinion. And, and like I said, there are some things I'm learning now as well, and I will look into that, because you know, sometimes we have to revalidate, hey, is this the right direction? We've been using this now for quite some time, um, and I think we're still learning from the industry, because there are new insights and how to go forward with this, like CISLOPA. But I think we're using CISLOPA in a very defined manner, like most of the industry, so I think even there, we if, found to be more conservative in some areas. Yeah. Okay, thank However, you. However, as, as far as this gentleman was talking about integration, and, and I think you're, <laughs> you're talking about HMI integration, what the operator sees, HMI integration, I, I mean, I don't care. The, the, the HMI um, should not be able to directly access 
the safety system so that the operator can actually push a button and, and inhibit a safety function. That's not good. But if the indication comes up on the operator's screen that he's just had a trip uh, by his safety system, then that, well, that only makes sense, right? You don't want the guy flipping screens continuously trying to find information. I don't think that would be of benefit to anybody. Um, I guess in, in a nutshell, the, the, the block diagram for a safety function, a SIF, has to be kept the way uh, it's specified in IEC 61511, separate. Uh, using a sensor to do both a uh, SIS and a BPCS uh, function uh, violates IEC 61511 and, and introduces common cause. Each component of the block diagram is the same. If, if you double up on controllers, you have the same problem. And if you double up on final control elements, you have the same situation. So in order to maintain simplicity so that the, the operations, people aren't, aren't totally confused of where things are coming. I mean, I, I suppose I could, I could share this little bit of information. There, there was a time in, in one of the companies that I worked for where, you know, they were getting 61,000 alarms a day. Now, how does an operator deal with 61,000 alarm instances in a day? And that was because there was integration between the safety functions that the BPCS was doing, the safety functions that the SIS was doing, and fire and gas was thrown in as an additional mix. Oh, by the way, and so was uh, heat trace. So, you just have to make logical decisions and, and, and logical choices. Look at really what you want to do and keep it simple. Okay, was there another question from the floor in the back corner, please? Please identify yourself. Yeah, hi, my name is Mike Scott with AE Solutions. Uh, uh, I'm a S84 committee member, voting member since 98. I'm also on 61511 committee. And so I find this topic uh, highly interesting to say the least. Uh, 61511 is in draft at the moment. You guys may or may not be aware of that. And this topic of BPCS independence and credits is actually being tackled in the standard. Uh, they have, probably with feedback from the end users, uh, are proposing to allow additional credits. And there's some criteria in place where I can take two BPCS credits in LOPA for one scenario, or I could take a BPCS alarm credit, a BPCS control credit, or a BPCS cause and a BPCS credit. But the, the criteria in all this is that they've got to be, uh, uh, they have criteria for our hardware, but they do have to be able to independent from some shape, form, or fashion with respect to the detection of the hazard itself. There's also a CCPS a guideline on this as well that I think they were using as a modeling on one of the CCPS books. So there is additional flexibility that's common in 61511 might make some of you really happy, might make some of you really sad, um, but there's some changes coming as the message, so. Okay, thank you very much. Sir, yeah, there's a question here. Thanks, Alan. Please, uh, please identify yourself. Yeah, my name is Abdullah Khalifa from Saudi Aramco. Uh, I have two comments and um, one more question. Uh, regarding the uh, question from the gentleman back there, regarding the use of the diagnostic uh, data from smart, uh, uh, from the actuators, I have seen uh, cases where using sm uh, the, the, the uh, actuator to do uh, self-stroking, uh, if you increase the frequency by, by utilizing this technology to increase the frequency of testing, you may take credit to during the cell verification to bring the loop from cell three to cell, to change the cell rating of the loop <clears throat> by increasing the frequency of uh, uh, s stroking uh, the, the valve or testing the valve online. Uh, the second uh, point regarding the use of uh, field and instrument to share the field and instrument with the, uh, with the basic process control and the SES, 
Uh, I think it is allowed provided that you terminate or uh, connect the, the field instrument directly to the SIS first and then through the communication network send the data to the DCS for, for display. But it has to be terminated to the uh, DCS first. M my question to, to the to the panelist here is uh, the requirement for segregation is, is really stem for, from the standard requirement to keep two independent protection layer. And uh, the probability of failure on demand for the SIS is, is, uh, is a lot higher uh, or better than the, the basic process control, whether it's a DCS or something else. M my question, do you uh, expect or do you see in the future that as a result of demand from end users who want to optimize, especially for a sm small application where you, hand, you have hands full of, of uh, control uh, loops and, uh, and, and safety loops, uh, to, to, to comply with the standard regulations, you will end up with two different systems, maybe 10 I.O. here, another uh, few I.O.s here. There is a benefit for the end user to, to, to basically optimize the solution. Uh, this is a, requ a request or, 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 a, or a demand or a hope that the end user uh, would like to see on, on, a, on a specific application that are treated or handled as an exception. Uh, the, 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 the other point, do you think that the uh, DCS supplier or the basic process control system supplier will uh, improve the performance or the availability or failure rate or reliability of their hardware to be at the same level as the safety system, so we will be uh, looking at the same probability of failure on demand mm -hmm. for, from, for, for, for the same hardware? That's a couple of questions there. Did you guys catch those? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mike, do you want to? I, I don't want to. Well, while it's, we have oft times talked about just using safety rated. I.O. circuits for everything, including DCS, and then you effectively achieve what you just described it, as far as having the same diagnostic coverage and the same SIL ratings, then it comes down to the logic solver. But this is not in line with the standard, which clearly say, oh. and been, this is not a, uh, if you, uh, if you come, uh, uh, if you look at the standard I, or interpret the stand, IEC standard, it says clearly independent protection layers. So yes, using the, the CIS, which has a higher uh, reliability figures, uh, and, and take a credit for it, fine, but it does not meet the segregation. Right. You're, it's still one layer. Yeah, I was really just talking about the possibilities of, of doing that with the I.O. To, to what I also took from your question was you were looking for more granularity of uh, the, the size of the systems, both from a safety and a process control that you could configure. Is that correct? Yeah. So, therefore, you need... Small uh, systems. Uh, pardon? Is, I thought, Smaller I just systems. just took the question as small configurable systems. Configurable I.O. in both cases so that you could achieve total flexibility of those smaller systems. Yeah, especially for wellhead application, mm -hmm. for example. I have a few number of IOs. I have a safety requirement and a control and monitoring requirement. Two systems at a remote site is a lot of expense. And therefore, may maybe you need 50% safety functions and 50% just control and monitoring functions. But you'd rather not configure two disparate systems sitting out there to accomplish that function. So, again, designs and, and architectures of that nature are things that at least Triconics is currently looking into, yes. Uh, do we have it today? No. But I, I do believe, given the standards and some of the, uh, uh, the developments that are feasible these days, and certainly the direction the market in general is headed with configurable I.O., what you describe is not too far over the horizon. That, okay. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much. Um, 
I thank the audience. Uh, we've, we've really run out of time. And uh, note there will be, I suspect, ice cream in the next room served uh, in a minute. So I'll give you a minute or two of lead time. But thank you very much for your excellent questions. And please join me in thanking this panel.